Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for all of the ways that you are moving here. We give you thanks for laughter and for joy, for your spirit that is on the loose. God, we give you thanks for the ways that you surprise us each day and pray that you would surprise us again today, that you would open our eyes to allow us to see you right in front of us, and that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive what you would have to say to us. God, we love you and we praise you. Amen. This week we are continuing our sermon series on the book of James. And if you have been with us the last couple of weeks in worship, you will know that James is blunt and to the point. James doesn't dance around what um, the author would want to say to the community, just says it and moves on. The book of James as a whole is centered around this idea that everyone has what they need to thrive and to succeed in society. And that this new way, in order to thrive and to succeed, that the community must look at life from the way of the law of God. Through Jesus, James encourages the people to, to live in a way where no one has particular privilege or power over another. And throughout the book, there's this tension between the ways that the community has done things in the past and how the author thinks that they should be living now. The members of the community think that their actions don't impact the larger group, but the writer of James is telling them that their actions have direct consequence, that their individual actions impact the entire community. You see, the people of this community have been so busy living into their own desires of trying to succeed that they are ignoring the needs of those around them. And so James writes this letter to share his vision that there would be a community of loving one another so much that everyone would experience life abundant, that everyone would be able to thrive and to succeed. I don't really know where this magical community is there's nowhere that I know that lives this out perfectly. But if there is, if you know where this exists, sign me up because I'm ready to move. This place where no person is better than another. This place where all have what they need. This is the vision of the kingdom and this is what James is talking about this morning. One of my favorite things about the book of James is that it is blunt and to the point. The writer is not speaking in these big, hypothetical, theological ideas, but gets right to the point of how this community can live out the gospel day to day. How this community can live into the teachings of Jesus. And this week's scripture is no different. James's instructions to the community this week are about wisdom and about friendship with the world. And if you were listening to the scripture being read by George, it is pretty straightforward. First, James says that wisdom does not come from within us. It's not the same as intelligence. As Daniel said in the children's message, it's not about how smart you are. It's not about how much knowledge you have about one particular subject or even all of the subjects. It's about who you are deep within. The dictionary definition of wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. It's more in depth than just being able to recite some facts from a textbook. Many theological teachers, including Thomas Aquinas, argue that wisdom is given to all of creation, that we all have the ability for, to have wisdom. But as human beings, we fall short that we're not able to fully grasp it. And if we're not able to fully grasp wis wisdom, then we're not able to fully grasp God. But that's okay because we are not divine and God does not expect perfection. James says that wisdom from God is pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, 
full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Can you imagine having that entire list of things? Now I know why Solomon asked for wisdom from God when he could have anything in all of the world. Wisdom was Solomon's heart's desire. Perfect wisdom, beauty, and fullness. And I would like to think that most of us desire this kind of wisdom, right? That we want this, we want this wisdom, we want this way of being deep within our souls. But again, we are human, we're not divine, and so we sin. We become preoccupied with the world's definition of wisdom, and we forget about God's. James says that the world's version comes within with envy and selfish ambition. None of us have ever done anything out of selfish ambition, right? It's this type of seeking that leads us to disputes with others, unwilling to listen, unwilling to humble ourselves so that we could then hear from God. So often we become focused on our own wants and our desires that we forget to stop and listen to those around us. We live in a way that our words and our actions don't align. Or if they do, they come from this place, not of service and love, but from wanting our own desires to get ahead in this world. We want to be good but we also want to be needed by others. We want to be successful. We want to be unique. We want to be knowledgeable. We want to be able to survive on our own, to be free from pain, to be independent, and yet still connected. We want, and we want, and we want. And James says that these wants on their own are not a bad thing, but they are just come from within us if they just come from wanting to get a little further ahead in this world? Where are your motivations coming from? Do they come from you and the world? Or are they aligned with God? See, scripture says when we are living into God's desires, things are good. But when we are living into our own, that is when disputes break out between us. The writer goes as far to say is there is war and there is murder. And maybe that is not, I hope that that is not quite the extreme that we are living into. We do all get in disputes with one another. We all have those days when there is more conflict than there is peace. And I'm not saying that conflict itself is bad, that naming our hurts and disagreements are bad. It's good if we do it in a respectful way. But I have a feeling that often when we are in conflict, we don't speak out of respect for one another. That second part of chapter 4, verse 2 resonates deep with me. You covet something and you cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. But you do not have because you do not ask. Before I moved to D.C. and started working here at St. Matthew's, I lived in Detroit and worked at a community center with individuals experiencing homelessness. And my main responsibilities were around casework, seeing clients one-on-one each day. But sometimes it was my task to help get the community center ready for lunch. One morning in particular, I was in the kitchen preparing for lunch, and I was not in a good mood. I was really tired, and it was in the middle of winter, and if you have lived in the Midwest in the middle of winter, it was a typical dreary gray day. We had not seen the sun in longer than I could count, and I was tired. I just wanted some sun. I wanted some good rest. And so that morning, as I began setting up the kitchen, Expecting our volunteers, because we partnered with different churches, and volunteers would come to volunteer in the kitchen each morning. So there was this group of 10 volunteers that were supposed to join me any minute. And when my boss sent me to the kitchen to get ready for lunch, he said, just get it until, just keep working until the volunteers get there, and then they know what to do, and you can resume doing casework. 
So I'm setting up the kitchen, expecting these volunteers, and the minutes continue to go by. And each minute I'm waiting and they just are not showing up. And I keep getting more and more irritated. I'm in my head that I have more important things to be doing than filling sugar and creamer containers. There was too much to do and not enough time, but I just kept my head down, determined to get this job done. My coworker walked in after about 25 minutes of the volunteers running late and me in the kitchen by myself. And my coworker walks in dancing to some music. It is streaming from his phone and he just has this big grin on his face, which maybe our roles were just reversed because he was definitely not a morning person. But he walks in with this music streaming and he is dancing around the kitchen, all excited for some, morning, for some reason. And I completely snap at him. I said, are you gonna help me or are you gonna keep dancing? I don't care what you do, but if you're not gonna help, get out of the kitchen. Right? Wow. Wow. Not typical language from me, right? But I was so annoyed, and I had been working for so long with my head down, not paying attention to what was happening. Luckily, Matt is one of my best friends. And at this point, we had been working together for about a year, and so he knew that this was not my typical behavior. So instead of snapping back at me, he stopped and he smiled, and he kept on dancing. <laughs> and I just kind of stayed there like this, looking at him like, what are you doing? I'm about to strangle you. When he said, can't I dance and move these boxes at the same time? And it was then that we both burst into laughter. You see, I had been in my head all morning long, annoyed that no one was helping, but never once had I done the second part of that verse and had I asked for help. I was determined to do it by myself, even if I was miserable in the process. I thought that I could do it, and I wanted and was seeking to be praised for doing it on my own. My external actions were good though, right? I was prepping the kitchen, I was getting our community center ready for the day, but my heart was not in the right place. My heart was acting from selfish ambition. My beginning actions may have been positive, but my internal being was focused on worldly wisdom rather than that wisdom and motivation from God. Thank goodness God interrupted that morning with Matt and his crazy dance moves. This way that we normally would have fun and we would work and joy would happen together. God interrupted with a burst of dancing and of laughter. My desire of getting it done on my, by myself out of pride and foolishness were interrupted with this simple act of love and generosity that then transformed my morning. James instructs us to submit ourselves before God, to draw near to God, and in the process, God will draw near to you. The funny thing about this is I don't think that God's position really changes. God is always constant, always close, it's a matter of do we recognize God? Do we seek the wisdom from our creator? Or are we too busy doing our own thing? Living with focus on the world's standards of what needs to get done or accomplished, the ways that we are told um, that doing well and succeeding looks like. Are we so busy focusing on all of those things, that we miss God right in front of us. We miss God standing right in front of us, calling us to stop and to have a conversation with a stranger or to take a deep breath before responding in an argument or to pick up our head from whatever we are doing 
and to dance around the kitchen. God is calling us into this life of freedom and of grace and of love and joy. And the scripture says these things are always coming from God. This constant invitation into life abundant. My prayer and hope for you this week is that you would have the wisdom that comes from God. That you would live that wisdom out through good works, but that those good works would be grounded in a spirit that is pure and peaceable, gentle and willing to yield, full of mercy, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. May you live this week full of that type of grace and humility, drawing nearer to God and recognizing that God is beside you every step of the way.